you for taking some time out. And what I love about this is, just to give you an idea, I was a business and economics major. So when Josh talks about the, the, the economics of how everything works, it's like, you know, it's like music to my ears. And so, um, and, and the other thing is we did this last year and it was so successful. And then we, we actually recorded it. We had thousands of people watch it online. And so and the, the great thing about this um, event is, or what he talks about is this is stuff that's gonna help you in your business, help you sell more real estate. And then at the end, after he leaves, we're gonna share a bit that um, Bert at Inter, Intercap Mortgage um, and I have worked on for the last year to help actually get our buyers off the fence, okay? Um, so, um, and, and also I want to know, or let you know that this was sponsored by Intercap and us here at the Lawson team, but mostly Intercap, and we want to thank Josh and Bert Hoagland. He's only the best lending partner on oh, the yeah. planet, right? So, <laughs> if you need a lender, um, Call me and I'll, I'll, I'll refer to you. Will you pay me a referral fee? <laughs> <laughs> Four years ago, yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, without any further ado, I just want to introduce and thank Josh Romney for coming up. And I think you guys are going to like just be blown away with what you're going to learn here. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, David. Right. That's a lot of pressure. Um, I hope to blow you away. Maybe not. If you're not blown away, it's David's fault. Um, but I want to thank Bert and David for bringing me up here. Bert is uh, an incredible guy to work with. I'm lucky to be able to work with him. Um, really smart guy, really talented guy. So hopefully we'll get to use him at some point. Um, so just to kind of, there, there's really, I think, almost never been a more interesting time to be in real estate. Not good time, but interesting time. Um, I will say um, I've been in real estate for a long time. I've made the most wealth when things are really in turmoil. It's not the most money. I haven't actually made any cash, but I've generated the most wealth. And I think those are two different things. But this is a time um, in real estate where all of us can generate a tremendous amount of wealth. Not necessarily a lot of cash, but over the next few years is when the cash will start coming. But now is the opportunity and the time to really be building um, your networks and doing things um, that will pay dividends and as, uh, as rates start coming down. So um, this is forecast from three different groups about where they think rates are going to be. Uh, in 2024, see they're pretty close, but also a little bit different. By the end of 2024, the Mortgage Bankers Association thinks we're at 6.1. Goldman Sachs and Fannie, uh, or Fannie Mae, think we're at about uh, high sixes. Um, so we don't really know what's going to happen in 2024. There's a lot of things that can shift this. My guess is all these numbers would be different today. This is about two weeks ago this came out. My guess is these would likely all be different today. Um, and, uh, and I think there's going to be some potentially some things that make this wildly different and we just have to pay attention to what those things are going to be. Um, one thing we've seen, um, anyone that's paying attention for the last 24 hours, um, this is, I actually had this, done, this uh, thing done yesterday and had to redo it um, because it dropped so much. It was at 4.2 yesterday, 3.9 today, um, and uh, so a huge, huge drop, um, which is really meaningful for all of us in the room and I will explain why this is the main reason why so the 10 year that i just showed so this right here this number is the green number right here the blue number is the average mortgage rate so you can look when the green number moves mortgage rate moves as well so not always right away but um but pretty closely so they are very very highly correlated so investors are buying mortgage-backed securities or they're buying treasuries and they're weighing the differences between the two but they they calculate the risk very similarly um, they pay, they charge a higher premium for mortgage-backed securities, um, but they're, they're really closely correlated. Um, the difference, the gap between those two, we call it the spread, the mortgage spread. The mortgage spread on average historically is about 170 basis points. So that is like, if you look back for a long, long period, so people want about 170 basis points more on mortgage. They do on a, on a 10 year, but you can look, if you go to the end, so this is uh, where we are right now, 2023, um, that spread is 300 basis points. So that's a big, big spread. That happens for a number of reasons, but basically to simplify it, when there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of uncertainty, that spread gets big. As that turmoil and uncertainty goes away, that spread gets smaller. We anticipate this will go back to 170 at some point. So if you think about what that would do, if it went back to 170 today, rates would drop 1.5%, nearly, maybe 1.3%. 1 
So that's a huge, huge drop in mortgage rate uh, that's being priced in simply because investors are uncertain about the market, they're nervous about the market, um, and so that gap has gotten really high. So, yeah. Is that, is that due to refinance? Is that what that? Um, so there's a few reasons why that happens. One, um, there's some. There's a few reasons why this gap gets big. One is because mortgage-backed securities. If you hold a mortgage-backed security at a really high rate, let's say you bought mortgage-backed securities at eight percent. Really exciting rate to have. You're going to have um, hopefully 30 years of payments at 8%. What's the reality of that? You're going to have those payments as long as rates stay high. As soon as they come low, um, almost every bar we saw this, when rates got to 3%, every bar would refinance really quickly. So what will happen is a lot of these investors are buying more back securities to get their money back at a time when they have to redeploy in a worse environment. So they, they just that uncertainty really pushes them to want to go more towards the certainty of a 10-year treasury. Where if you buy a 10-year treasury at 4.5% or 3.9 today, you are getting 10 years of payments without any question. And it's um, the, the safest investment in the world. Um, still has some risk to it, but um, theoretically the safest investment in the world is the U.S. 10-year treasury, or any treasury sold by the U.S. government. Um, what we're all watching now, we watched yesterday, I don't know if anyone saw this, uh, Jerome Powell's quote yesterday, this is why, this is the reason, so if you wonder why the market did that yesterday, it's because of a few words that he said. And so the market is following this guy really closely. Um, and so we're, we're really paying attention to what the Treasury's doing and what he's saying. Um, did anyone see, no one probably watched it, right? No one's a geek okay. like me. <laughs> okay, tell them the slide. Well, you, know, you, you know what happened with in, um, the stock market and real estate? Most of the real estate stocks yesterday went up 10 to 20 percent one day. Today they're only up five to 10 percent in one day. That's what's happened in two days because of what what he's saying. They're predicting interest rates are coming down, which means real estate's going to take off. So um, they do say, like in a in a volatile roller coaster real estate market, the only way to really get hurt is to jump off. So if you had jumped off the roller coaster, you'd have lost a lot of money yesterday because you weren't in the market. So markets are, anyway, if you have money in the stocks, just keep them there. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so we'll talk about what Jerome Powell said yesterday, but this is what he's done. So um, he's raised interest rates. So this black line right here is, is currently where we are. Um, these other lines are what, where, when the Fed started raising interest rates in other periods where the Fed was trying to slow things down. So 2004, 98, 94, 99, these are other periods of interest rate hikes and how fast they were. Um, and you can see we've gone higher and faster than we ever have in history. So this is really, really dramatic. They put the brakes on so aggressively. They've never done it. Uh, they've never done anything like this as aggressively as they did this go around. Yes. Yeah. They're still tightening. So, yeah, so the Fed was one of the largest purchasers of mortgage-backed securities. So one of the ways they were boosting their balance sheet. They were buying mortgage-backed securities aggressively. They were, became the largest um, borrower of mortgage-backed securities. So if you look at why interest rates got so low, it wasn't just that we had um, this number so low. It's that they were buying aggressively mortgage-backed securities, and they went from buying to letting it roll. They actually didn't start selling. Fortunately, they didn't start selling the positions, but they're letting them roll off. Um, and the reality is their balance sheet is shrinking a bit. Um, it shrank a bit until the banking crisis, and then it skyrocketed again. So their balance sheet has actually kind of been bouncing around a little bit, but when they saw some of the regional banks get in trouble, they started throwing a lot of money towards regional banks. So they, they talk about shrinking their balance sheet. Um, it's not shrinking as aggressively as we like, um, but it is still shrinking. So. But two things are happening kind of at the same time. One, we have the brakes being put on as aggressively as we've ever seen them. The other thing that's happening is we have government spending as high as we've ever seen it. So we have a foot on the gas and a foot on the brake as hard as they've ever been pushed in history. So, um, so one of those two is gonna win. Um, and that's kind of, that's been the play and that's kind of what's happening in the market right now. And, um, and if, if you can imagine, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of scenarios and we've never seen anything like it. So there's a lot of, so we talk about uncertainty. This is partially why. So when you have one foot on the gas, one foot on the brake, um, occasionally my wife drives like, like that, um, it's not real comfortable. So, um, but I'll talk about where I think this is gonna head. So um, one thing we've seen, 
consumer spending continues to be elevated. Consumer spending is the largest driver of, the GD of GDP. So consumer spending is still above the trend line. We're spending more as a population than we've, we've really ever spent before. So this, is, um, this would lead Jerome Powell to think inflation is going to keep going, which is why they've raised interest rates so high. So interest rates are really high, large part because of this, also because um, the government's spending so much money. So those two things are kind of making them, that's why a lot of economists are saying they're going to keep it high, they're going to keep it high, maybe for a long time. Um, but yesterday, I will say, he basically said um, they are unlikely to raise much more, if at all, and likely to see a 75 basis point reduction in 2024. So three 25 basis point reductions in 2024. So that was, that's what caused a lot of the excitement. So um, that's where the market really exploded. Uh, basically said, we're done with all this. The, the Fed is now going to focus on its second mission. So we all know the Fed's first mission, which is, to fight on, uh, which is to fight inflation. We know they're fighting inflation. They actually have two missions, not just inflation. They have another. Does anyone know what their other mission is? Unemployment. unemployment. So now they're saying, oh, well, let's maybe start worrying about unemployment because we think inflation seems to be trending the right way. It's actually far ahead of where we thought it would be. Let's start worrying about unemployment. So I want you to keep that in mind as we're talking through this, unemployment. Um, but let's talk, this is the month between Fed rate changes from the last increase. So how long after their last increase do they start decreasing? We are right here. So we're like five months um, after the last increase. Uh, the longest was in 2006. They waited over a year to start decreasing. So um, hopefully we don't wait a year, but you can kind of see there's different periods, different times where they go from increasing to decreasing. I will tell you what the market's predicting. This is the market as of this morning. The market predicts the first 25 basis point decrease in March. That's what the market thinks. Um, now, the market is wrong a lot. This will shift um, by the week, by the day. The market is really shifting. But if you think about what the stock market's doing, what everything's happening, this is what they're predicting. And they're predicting a lot of decreases. Um, and they're actually, I'll, I'll show you how much so they're predicting, so this is yesterday before Jerome Powell spoke. They were predicting about a hundred, um, 115 basis point reduction um, next year. So Jerome Powell came out and said, we'll do 75. So the market says, okay, let's price in 150. So the market's pricing it. They think Jerome Powell was soft selling it. Market's pricing in 150 basis points of reduction next year. So that's saying um, theoretically that um, mortgage rates should be 1.5% lower than they are today. I don't know if that's true, um, I, but this is what the market's saying. Now, you can see how much the market shifts. So it's really volatile, it's changing every day. But if you look at what happened to the stock market yesterday, it happened because they thought this is going on. So it's really kind of interesting to see the dynamics at play there. Um, so I'm talking a lot about this because I think interest rates, um, we all kind of live and die. We realize that by the interest rate. When interest rates get to seven or eight, things get really slow. Um, but if things get for 150 basis points lower, Bert will be at seven today, a little under seven. Um, a little bit under. So that would put us, let's say, at five and a half a year from now. So considerably better than the predictions that any of those models had um, from Fannie, uh, Mortgage Bankers Association, or Goldman Sachs. So I don't know if that's true. I actually tend to not think. I think the market's over responding, over reacting to this. I don't think it'll be that low. I don't think we'll be in the mid fives by the end of next year. Um, the market does, so we'll see. Um, Goldman Sachs, uh, who I trust more than the market, um, they're, much, um, they're, they're giving it much less. They're, they're basically saying the inflation is going to be much stickier. Inflation, they thought it'd be easy to get to three. They think it's going to be really hard to get it to two. So, um, and if that is the case, if it's hard to get it to two, then rates are going to stay higher longer than any of us like. And the reason they think it's going to get harder to get it from three to two because, is because government spending continues to be elevated. So the Inflation Reduction Act um, that President um, Biden passed in his first, uh, first year in office um, was not necessarily an Inflation Reduction Act. It's probably been one of the, one of the factors that's really helped uh, increase in inflation. He spent about a trillion dollars um, in addition to government spending there, so they increased spending by a trillion dollars to reduce the inflation, um, but not really. It was a mostly green initiative, but um, before that, um, President Trump spent about five trillion uh, above and beyond what we normally spend. So if you think there's an extra six trillion dollars in government spending, that's still working its way through the system. So six trillion dollars 
that was pumped in to prevent um, major recession or depression from COVID and other things that's now still just kind of working its way through the system. Um, in addition to the fact that the government continues to just spend um, and spend and spend and really nobody's addressing uh, balancing the budget at all. Um, so inflation, we talk about inflation, the, the target is 2%. Uh, we're now down to 3.1%, uh, 4% on the core, uh, but 3.1%. So um, that's what a lot of economists thought would be the easy part, getting to three. We'll see, really be watching closely how easy it is to get from three to two. And that's going to be the big question. Um, so one of the biggest factors, in my opinion, um, in getting us um, to a point where the Fed's really going to get comfortable lowering rates is going to be unemployment because this will be their second charge. Um, and I think they might start to take their eye off the inflation ball a little bit, focus more on, on unemployment. But as of right now, how's unemployment? Even though we hear about job losses, we see it in the tech sector, we see it in the news, unemployment is at an unsustainable level. We, are, we have way too many jobs and way too few employees as of right now. Um, and so that's been a real problem. Uh, we've all seen that when you try and go out to eat somewhere or try and buy certain products or goods or get certain services done, uh, we don't have enough employees. Um, now, uh, and we also, w the reason this, one other reason, not just we don't have enough employees and get, can't get things done, it also causes hourly earnings really to escalate. So, which if you think about inflation and trying to uh, bring inflation down, when people are making more money, they're gonna spend more money. So we saw that chart, spending is up. This is a big, big part of the reason why is because people are making lots of money. Now, that trend line is coming down, but it's still really high, higher than average. So, um, so this is problematic. One thing that does give us some hope is uh, what you see right here, this green line is job openings. The blue line is, un or is, uh, is how many people are looking for jobs. So we're seeing the number of job openings is dropping pretty dramatically. So as, as you think, it hasn't crossed the blue line yet. We'd like to see it below the blue line, ideally. That shows a bit of a healthier market. Um, but we see that number, that green, coming down pretty aggressively. So if that continues on that trend, uh, we could be in a lot of trouble. Uh, they kind of want it to go just below the blue line and kind of flatten out, which is why I think Jerome Powell is now starting to talk about um, maybe starting to lower, uh, lower the interest rates. Um, but that is the big thing. So we just have way too many job openings and way too few employees. Um, and so until that shifts, um, we're not going to really see ma major interest rate differences, in my opinion. Now, um, this is one, this is going to not look great to you guys. It won't make a lot of sense, but it's one of the most interesting graphs I've seen in the last few years. And this is basically saying the evolution of initial uh, unemployment claims after the yield curve in inversion. So basically after, um, it's essentially after the, the Fed starts raising interest rates, how long until we start seeing job losses? And the average is one year. So it takes one year, actually after they stop raising interest rates. So essentially it takes a year um, to really start to see um, unemployment rise. And this is where we are today. And so we still have a number of months before we start to see unemployment if we're on a traditional record. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if you remember where we are today and how fast, so we've, we've risen interest rates higher and more aggressively than we ever have in the past. So if you think about this, and what everyone's basically saying right now is this isn't going to happen, that we're not going to have the unemployment. This is going to be a soft landing. The entire market is kind of saying, we think we've made it. We think we've managed. This is going to be a soft landing. So everyone's saying that even though every other time we've been through one of these, this has happened, this time is different. <laughs> so I'm glad I got a laugh. So um, I, I tend to think that it's going to look more like this. I think we're going to have massive job losses. Um, I am one of the few that thinks that. Uh, there is one other. Um, there is a guy I met uh, at a conference who was, uh, he manages a little, he's a, he manages, um, manages a, a small account. Um, it was actually interesting. I asked him how, what is, how much money he's managing and uh, you would never be able to guess. It was $2.5 trillion that he manages. Um, he manages a fixed income account of $2.5 trillion. He actually manages some of the federal government, government money. Uh, he's that smart. And he thinks this is happening. And he thinks Jerome Powell needed to start lowering interest rates months ago, not in a few months. So he's really, really nervous that we're going to see massive unemployment. Um, this is, I mean, it's uncertain. So a lot of people disagree with me vehemently. 
They think that we've kind of, we've achieved a soft landing. The economy is really robust. It's really strong. We have a lot of money pumped in from the government. It's going to prevent this from happening. Um, I tend to think history repeats itself over and over. And every time, um, I guess on every one of these, they also said the same thing, that we're not going to have unemployment spikes. Um, but if you can imagine what happens when unemployment is going to spike or if it spikes, what's the Fed's response to that? Lower interest rates, aggressively and fast. So, um, so that, would be, that would be problematic in the real estate market because we would have not enough houses to sell and a lot of people trying to buy them with low interest rates. So it feels a little bit like what happened last go around. So um, now, even if this doesn't happen and we don't have these huge unemployment spikes and the Fed starts slowly lowering interest rates and like we get to a five and a half, the five and a half percent, by the way, that's a 150 basis point. That doesn't include the other 150 or 130 basis points spread, the, uh, the spread between the, the, the 10 year and the mortgage backed security. So it's theoretical that we could get back to a kind of a more of a long term 5% or under mortgage rate in the next, I, I don't know when, but at some point in the next few years. Just a question, Josh. Yes. Um, so you said it takes a year after the interest rates go up for them to, for, for us to see the, the mm -hmm. problem that it creates. If it comes down, how long does it take to correct? Everything moves. This is like the economy is, is driving an oil tanker and not, um, not a nice little car. So everything moves really, really slowly and responds really slowly. So the triggers they use, so raising interest rates, if you think about what it does, um, it doesn't really affect very many consumers unless they have massive credit card debt. It's not really affecting consumers. It's not affecting people renting homes. It's not affecting people in existing homes. It is affecting some people trying to buy new homes or have massive credit card debt, but it's affecting businesses and the businesses are slow to respond. They'll eventually let people go. They'll slow down their hiring. All that takes a long time to get to the system. And lowering does the same thing. It's not going to impact most people directly. It'll impact their employers. It'll impact some massive job um, creators on, on the fringes. And it just takes a long time for that to go into effect. And especially a lot of people have long-term debt in place. So even if you raise interest rates on me like 10 times, I don't really, as a real estate investor, I don't really care because all my loans are locked for another two or three years. I'm not going to feel it for two or three years. So it just takes a long, long time for a lot of these um, movements from the Fed to take effect, both up and down, which is why that, that guy that invests, that manages 2.5 trillion said the Fed is about six months late. He's really nervous and he's like preaching it to everyone. He's like, he's got to do it. He's got to do it. Uh, and he's a heck of a lot smarter than me, um, but he sees this happening and he's really worried about it. So, but, but nobody, the, the reality is we've never been in a position where we've had the brake and the gas on as aggressive as we, as we have right now. So the reality is no one really knows. We really, really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, it's created a nice spread. But we at, at least feel like in this room and kind of have a consensus that rates are going to start coming down at least partially in the next year, which will have a huge impact um, to, to all of us. Uh, I will just say just like briefly, so if we think about what's going to happen long term, this is the government spending. We are right, this is government interest payments, how much they're, um, how much you're paying in interest. And you can see what's happening in the future. It's just, it's horrendous. Um, we're going to continue to spend a lot more money, but I'm going to skip all that. So um, I'm going to skip all that. Basically, we're out of money, but we're going to keep spending. So um, at some point, it's going to be a problem. Uh, okay, so let's talk purely housing. What's going to happen in the housing market? where I think the housing market's gonna go. Um, we're looking at, we see a lot of national numbers. <clears throat> and we look at a lot of national numbers. The reality is every market's behaving a little bit differently. We're seeing some hot markets and some cold markets. So a lot of cold markets down here, a lot of hot markets in the Northeast. What's interesting is this is almost opposite of what we saw during COVID. And the reality is the hot markets got too hot. It, it, we grew too fast in Utah. We drew, grew too fast in parts of California and <clears throat> Texas some of those other states. And if you look, if you compare this to um, actually right here, <clears throat> where the largest decreases are is where the largest increases were. So Austin, Texas um, is having a huge decrease, um, but they also had um, the highest increase. So they had a 43% increase. Now they're dealing with a 10% or almost 17% decrease. Um, but that's after a 43% increase. So those huge, huge increase in numbers, Boise, Idaho is another. They had a 44% increase. Now they're dealing with a 12% decrease. <clears throat> So if you look at Salt Lake um, and Provo, Ogden, we had um, a 41% increase 
which is actually kind of almost as much as Austin, and we're only dealing with an 8% decrease. Um, you look at Salt Lake City, 41 again, 7% decrease. So much healthier than even some of these other markets like Boise, Austin, San Francisco, others. So, so we are, uh, we have the huge increase and we're not really getting the big decrease like other markets. We all know why that is. Inventory, right? Uh, we just don't have the inventory here. Um, in terms of like putting the price decrease in perspective, this is, uh, we'd actually, so Salt Lake would be more like right here in that 6% range, but this is a national number. This is the <coughs> decrease we saw nationally. This is what 2000, the 2008 price looked like, that red bar. So this one's been like this, and kind of coming back up. This has been a really, really minor correction in the grand scheme of things. Um, and so probably not super healthy for the market and for anyone for affordability, um, but that's the reality of where we are. Um, I have about 10 different um, graphs of where predictions are from different companies, from Goldman Sachs to others. This is Case Shiller, but they basically all said the same thing. We saw a little bit of a dip, and we all see it coming back. Not aggressively, not massive, not a 40% increase, but three, four, five percent um, in markets. So that's kind of the consensus. Um, again, the consensus is, can often be wrong, but the general consensus now from almost um, every analytics group is saying they see a minor increase in 2024 in pricing. Um, so, um, what's interesting, um, and I like to think a little outside the box on this one, um, prices in Salt Lake we've seen stay, let's say they're down 7%. Um, I deal with a lot of home builders. Anyone know home builders offering incentives? So, just a few, right? All of them. If they're not, they're probably not selling homes. Um, so one group, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, I, I, yeah, it's probably fine, whatever. Uh, Lennar came off office, they say they only offer interest rates below 5%. Um, that's the way they sell homes. They won't sell, they won't do any offering unless it's, they won't buy any buy downs unless it's under 5%. Uh, and that 5% was costing about 15 basis points. So on a, you know, if you think about that, it's costing them $100,000 on a home to sell that rate, which is massive. Now what does the price say on that home? There was no discount. Right? Price is saying there's no discount on that home. You sold it full price. The builder spent $100,000 buying it down. You also think about um, a lot of homeowners. How many homeowners are doing 2 1 buy downs or offering other incentives? A lot of them. What does the price say? Full price sale. So I think even though it shows Salt Lake and other markets down 5, 6, 7%, we're actually down considerably more. Um, however, if rates come down, I don't think we'll actually see huge price reduction, um, but if rates don't come down, I don't think uh, builders and borrowers can go on this forever. So unless rates come down, I do think we'll start seeing some prices come down. Um, having said that, I do think rates are going to come down, so this will probably not play a huge factor. And in people's mental psyche, it's actually been, it's kept home prices and the perception of home prices high really solves. We're all hearing home prices are up or higher, um, and that's, that's kept that perception alive for all of us. Um, which is probably healthy for those in this room, and the reality is, as rates come down, um, the, the prices are, are going to continue to stay high. But it may not be as huge a bump as we all think. Um, I think that's been the theory, is that we're going to have this huge, massive bump as soon as rates come down. The reality is, as soon as rates come down, we're kind of back to where we are right now without offering the incentives. It's probably better for a seller, um, but maybe not massively different for a buyer. I know I, it'd be nice to say the prices are going to explode, um, but there's a couple reasons I don't think they absolutely explode, um, and I know David, you want me to say they're going to explode, but um, <laughs> but the reality is, pricing, uh, housing price is so unaffordable right now. It's just so expensive. It's so hard for people to get into housing, and we've already kind of priced in a lot of that reduction. And so it, we'll just we'll see what happens. Now, having said that, I think um, I do think there'll be a buyer feeding frenzy. I think homes will sell really fast. I think people will be in the market. It'll be aggressive. Um, you're going to be all very busy because homes are going to start trading, those homes that have been on the sideline, people not wanting to sell because, you know, we just want to sell in a better environment. Um, that stuff's all going to move really quickly. Um, and so I think it will be busy. I think it will be a feeding frenzy. I think prices will come up a bit. And, but everyone's kind of showing prices up a little bit, but not up. It's not going to be up 20%. So those ideas where it's just been completely crazy and the market's gone nuts, I don't think that's going, going to happen. I think a big part of that is because of the reductions we're actually a lot lower price uh, right now than we have been traditionally. So if you think about that, it probably is a really good time to buy right now because you're getting huge reductions. 
those all get priced back in. And if I'm a buyer and, uh, and Lennar offers me a 5% rate, I'm gonna say, can I have the $100,000 on that house? Absolutely. And I'll pay 7%, because yeah. that's a much, much better deal. Especially if you can refinance in six months at five and a half yeah. or six. So, um, so as you're working with your buyers, that's a much, much better deal. Emotionally, that's a really hard thing to do because you're gonna see that payment and have a heart attack. But if you feel like this market's gonna improve, any discount a buyer's willing to give you, I'd much rather take in a discount on the price of the house uh, or, and, and do that. So that's, that's gonna be a much better deal. Um, and I'm talk, you're talking to someone who makes money when builders do that, uh, but the reality is um, it, it helps sell and, and buyers are nervous and anxious and it's more secure. If you take that 5% rate, that's a safer bet, a much safer bet, um, but I think you're gonna leave a lot of money on the table if you do that. So yeah. Bert and I are gonna show you all a spreadsheet that we're gonna give you that explains that. <laughs> That it is so much better to buy right now. So yeah. what you just said, we're yeah. going to show you how to actually tell the agent uh, or tell your um, clients. Yeah. So I think I think a lot of us have been like the argument is <coughs> rates are going to explode, all and, and rates are going to go low, housing prices are going to explode, all that's going to happen, um, which is a great argument. I, I don't know if I 100% buy into it, but I actually think the better argument is prices are really low right now because everyone's offering discounts and it's not in the price. And we can offer all these great discounts. And if rates come down, you're going to get the discount today, and you're going to be able to get that really good rate in a year or six months, or whatever that is. At least six months, right, Bert? Yep. <laughs> Not five months, ideally. Um, yeah, we, get, we say marry the home yeah. and date the rate. Date the rate. Um, so you have to be careful saying that too fast. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I, I still think right now is a phenomenal time to buy. Um, in fact, people who are selling their homes right now are selling them for a reason. You can, you can get discounts, and I think you can get much more than that 7%, and I think that discount is wiped out. Uh, with, or I know that discount's gonna be wiped out a year from now. So, um, I guess not, no, I really feel like that. Um, inventory, we actually are seeing inventory start to creep back up, which is a good sign. Um, good sign and bad sign. Um, part of the reason it's creeping back up is we're just seeing sales really, really slow down. Uh, so when sales are slowing down, inventory starts creeping up a little bit. Um, but that's healthy fear for the market. We had, uh, we did not have enough inventory. So on a national, we're seeing inventory come up. One thing I think that's important to understand, um, in 2008, we were 2 million houses overbuilt nationwide. Um, right now, we're almost 2 million houses underbuilt. This is happening in almost every market. Not every market, but almost every market. Utah is more extreme. We're actually more underbuilt. Uh, 50 to 60,000 houses in Utah for our population, that's a huge percent. Um, but this is part of the big problem with housing affordability and the fact that um, when people hope that, or are nervous that you know, prices could come down a lot, this is one of the reasons they won't. Um, and this is not like making shoes or building cogs or any of that kind of stuff. It, housing is difficult to build. And when you're undersupplied, it's really hard to turn that machine up and get you back to oversupply. And there's a lot of things that are happening nationwide that are gonna keep that housing supply down almost permanently. Um, a lot of it dealing with cities and counties not wanting to approve things, but water restrictions, um, traffic restrictions, all these things are making new construction harder. So we're gonna almost essentially be in a housing deficit um, perpetually. And that means housing prices are gonna be stable and strong, even in a market where housing rates go from 3% to 7.5% to not see you know, a 90% reduction in price is miraculous. So the fact that price is held relatively stable when, when um, people's um, payment more than doubled is miraculous. Uh, that should not happen in a healthy market. We are in an unhealthy market because we are massively undersupplied. Um, I'm gonna skip this. We're just, I mean, this is essentially saying um, it's actually worse than we think. We think it's 3.5 million houses. I'm not sure I totally buy that number, um, but this is one economist going 3.5 million. Um, and we can see new construction being built. So this is a big part of the reason why we got into this deficit. Um, and you can see we started building our way out, but we came back down. So we're kind of now in that period of downward trend of new housing, which is not, um, not good for us, um, even though builders are still selling. So we can see builders are making up a higher and higher percent. So new builders, this is this gray bar, are making up almost 30% of all sales that are happening. So even though they're selling so many houses, they're having to offer that $100,000 discount so they don't like it, they're not making a lot of money, and so they're kind of, they're pulling back. They're waiting for a better time to be building, um, and it takes years to ramp this back up. Builders take a long time to get, uh, they're not, 
they're not improving lots right now. Um, they're not doing that stuff that usually takes, so they'll say they can build a home in 90 days, but it's gonna take them 18 months to get that lot ready. So they're not doing that part. So we're really, um, we're gonna see a housing shortage. We're not gonna build our way out of this. We're gonna see a housing shortage for a long time. Um, we're gonna see affordability. Now I'll skip this, but essentially affordability, this kind of shows the breakout. Affordability has almost never been worse. Big part of that because mortgage component um, it's just making things really, really unaffordable. Um, so this is just kind of interesting for you to think about. So uh, of a $400,000 mortgage, um, when you are at 3%, over the life of that loan, you're going to pay just under $500,000. If you go to an 8% mortgage, you're closer to seven hundred fifty dollars to $800,000 that you've paid for that house. So the difference between a 3% and an 8% mortgage is colossal. And the fact that we still didn't have housing price collapse when we went from here to here is, uh, shows you that we have some real fundamental ch challenges. Um, so I'm going to show you, there are three ways for us to get back. So any one of these three ways I will show you will get us back to um, pre-pandemic affordability. Um, so if they happen, so one, U.S. incomes have to increase by 69%. So if that happened, wow. we're back to pre-pandemic pre affordability. Home prices fall by 41%. That would, that would do it as well. So any one of these would do it. Home prices falling by 41%. Unlikely or not going to happen. Or mortgage rates go to 2.96. This is probably the most likely, but I think probably still not going to happen. The reality is we're never getting to pre-pandemic affordability. It's not going to happen. So if your perception is, I kind of want to wait, I want things to cool off and get back to where we were, things are only getting worse. We're building fewer homes. Um, things are not... We're not going to see a massive affordability. Everyone's affordability um, solution makes things worse. Like every time someone has this, oh, I have this idea. One of them was the Fed. Hey, let's get rates low. We're going to really lower rates, think, make things affordable. How long is that? It, it works for a bit. When you lower rates, it's affordable for a second. But then what happens? Housing prices explode. And now we're less affordable because then rates go up and they've, they've, they've gone backwards. So every federal government solution to affordable housing has not worked. Um, there are a couple that might work, but they haven't done them yet. Yes, Rob? Just to do the same thing, so it's not a real solution, but I heard there might be a 40-year mortgage again. Is that a thing at all? Bert, you want to talk about that? Where'd Bert go? Uh, there he is. Bert, you want to talk about the 40, what's the odds of a 40-year mortgage happening, do you think? I mean, that, what, a what year? 40-year. Probably not likely. Yeah. I think uh, Fannie and Freddie have kicked it around. They've talked about it. Um, I think it's unlikely to happen on a conventional basis. There's potentially some unconventional lenders, so non-QM lenders that would do it. Um, I, think it's, um, I think it's risky, I think, um, for both the borrower and the lender. So I, I think we'll see. It, it gets kicked around a lot, but I, at this point, we're not seeing any products that are offering a 40-year mortgage. But again, I think it would almost do the same thing. So the lowering rates in the long run just increases pricing. Um, if you can lower rates for certain individual groups, that actually can work. So there's certain target groups you want to help with affordability. So you want to say first time homeowner, you've never owned a home in your life. We're going to give you a little bit better of a rate and it's a federal government program that could work. But when you say the entire market, we're going to lower rates. It just has price has prices explode. Um, so um, let's see new construction contracts. So we're see we are actually seeing um, new contracts from prior years. So we're actually seeing um, activities start to pick up just a little bit. Um, nationwide. So this, everything below this line is, is decline. So things are getting worse. So if it's down here, if we see December 22, things were really bad, 40% decline. Um, we're starting, we're just barely starting to increase. At rallies, we're, we're at a really low number. So at a small increase from a really low number is not really exciting. You know, like a 10% growth from number one is 1.1, like not really exciting. So we're starting at a really low basis. So seeing little increases is actually not big numbers. Um, but it does show the trend is, is getting better. And we can see that trend, really kind of do see a trend line improving. And as rates come down, that we think, that trend line will increase. Um, I do just want to spend one minute talking about Utah. Um, 18 states lost pipe population over the last year. Um, Utah was not one of them. We are one of the lucky states. So if you think about where you want to be um, in real estate, you want to be in a state that's growing, not shrinking. Um, unemployment in Utah, 2.4%. U.S. 3.5 percent. What's interesting is this number is really hard for a nation to have unemployment that low um, because uh, it really just can't create jobs out of thin air. 
when this gets really low, it actually behaves a little differently. It's still hard in the short term, but what happens when unemployment gets really, really low in Utah? People move in. So if this number's hard, it's very hard for people to move in the U.S. We make uh, immigration policy really hard. Uh, this number, it's, there's no immigration policy. People can come in the state all they want. So this points to larger growth in the state of Utah. So if we are underhoused and we have low, low unemployment, uh, we have kind of a recipe for, for massive, massive housing appreciation in this state. Um, our GDP is growing faster as a percent of national GDP uh, than almost any other state. So our economy is strong. Um, active listings is relatively steady. Um, so we're actually seeing, we didn't have the massive drops and increases like other states. Uh, so we're actually in a little bit better of a position. Um, new, ha new home starts from March, or new home, yeah, new home starts from March 22 to March 2023, down 40%. This is very, so we're saying we're gonna have a lot of people moving in, economy's really strong, so we'll build 40% fewer houses. That's the solution. Um, now they're not, do so and if you look at, um, Number of dwelling permits per year. So in 2021, pulled 40,000. 2023 uh, and four forecast are in the high 20s. So we're, we're pulling fewer permits, building fewer homes, and we're 60,000 houses underbuilt. So this is a bad trend. We should be trending up, we're trending down. And it's the same reason we're seeing across the country. It's just harder and harder for builders to make their margin. Um, the developments are expensive. Um, land at some, at, a lot of land at this point has no value at all, uh, which is interesting because we're in this kind of weird period uh, where land becomes worthless because the construction cost and the improvement cost for the lot and construction costs are so high. And with, with uh, rates being as high as they are, uh, you can't afford to pay anything for the land and still have uh, any margin left for the builder. So it's made, um, it's, the high rates have kind of paused the market. So if, you know, if an ivory home wants to go out and buy a development, it's very hard for them to pay anything for the land um, because by the time they price everything in, it doesn't work. That explains why we're doing this. And it'll continue to do this until rates start to come back. So this doesn't behave like in Econ 101, we see supply and demand and supply is gonna come up. Um, you can throw that out the window for housing because it doesn't, it doesn't we, we can't build the supply at the time we really need it the most. We just are in a kind of a strange period. So those fundamentals still work, supply and demand pricing works. Um, but supply, but offering the supply is, is not going to work. Yes? Uh, that's a great question. So a big part of what's driving it right now is wages. So wage growth is, is still growing really aggressively. Um, we've just bid out a whole bunch of projects. Uh, what we've seen in the last year is a real stabil stabilization. Some things going down, some things like concrete actually still going up a little bit, um, but really things are stabilizing. We haven't seen prices come down much. Um, but we're not seeing them escalate. So people are much more comfortable giving a bid, letting it last for 60, 90, 120 days versus you know, the bids that you were getting that lasted for 24 hours. Um, and so I think things are gonna stabilize. I don't see, um, there'll be areas where prices come down. Uh, there'll be areas where they continue to, to grow. Um, so I don't see the cost of um, real, the cost savings being our saving grace. I think it's gonna have to come down to mortgage rates and lower rates is what's gonna make housing more affordable. Um, and, and I think, I think that's most likely to happen. And, uh, but we could see, I mean, you could see unemployment start to spike, but I don't see wages coming down a ton. I see them stabilizing and not growing, but probably not coming down a ton because things are more expensive. Um, so, uh, again, this is showing Utah housing permits declining. Uh, this is showing the actual numbers. Uh, we're going to share these slides. I'll share them with Bert and David. So if anybody wants any of these slides, you can go up, feel free to use them, um, and, uh, look at these more closely. But you can really see the decline in sales from 2021 at 40,000 to 2024 at 24,000. So just a significant decline. Um, again, we're seeing permits is showing the same thing. They started ramping up, now we're ramping down. Um, housing shortage. So we're seeing in 2024, I said 60,000, I actually meant 40,000. So sorry, uh, we're 40,000 houses short, 37,000 houses short from where we need to be. We've been as bad as 50,000. Um, but we're, we're kind of trending the wrong direction. So it's trending back up. So we're at about 30,000, now back up to 40,000. Um, this is where we're seeing, um, in terms of building permits, where they're growing and shrinking. Uh, actually, sorry, this is pricing. This is all price-based. Um, we're seeing, um, you can see the places where it had the highest growth, which would be Utah County having the, and Washington County, that's where things were growing the fastest, seeing the biggest declines. 
Um, and again, I think this is underestimating because of all the incentives that have been given. So if you think about right now being a time to buy, you might have you know, a 15 or 20% discount in Utah County today, um, or 12, whatever it is, but it's more than 10%. And you might have you know, 15% in Washington County. So you have a huge discount in place right now, which makes this a phenomenal time to buy. Buy when the rates are bad, and, and then refinance. Um, one final thing I'll just say uh, in terms of Utah, which is we have um, a very big state, massive state, but if, and if you put us on a map, you look at West Virginia, it's this little state that's about this size, we're actually, in terms of, if you take out all of our public lands, we are the size of West Virginia. That is the size of our state. Um, if you think about just our private ground, we have very limited private property in this state. We have very limited water. We have a lot of cities that have become relatively anti-growth, anti-population growth. And at the same time, we have massive population growth. A lot of people wanting to move in the state. So if you think about a recipe um, for exploding housing prices and exploding demand, we're creating it in Utah. Um, and so as I think about when to buy, what time to buy, you know, is this a good time to buy? I think it only gets worse from here in terms of housing affordability, even if rates come down, um, because I think the, right, the price will bump pretty quickly. Um, and so as, as you're working with your buyers, again, this is a phenomenal time to buy. It's a phenomenal market. Long run, this is going to be a great place to own real estate. Um, it's a great place to own a home and uh, a great place to raise a family. With that, I probably don't have time for questions. I apologize because I got to run. I would normally open up to questions, but I, I apologize. Um, my schedule got a bit mixed up today. Um, but I want to thank Bert and David. You guys have been incredible. Thank you for letting me come up. Thank um, you so and much. Really appreciate this. So, yeah. right. thanks, Bert. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Yeah.